to begin with, I, I, I just always am curious, did you yourself uh, go to the movies a lot as a kid? And, and if you did, were there any films or, or filmmakers that, that stand out in your memory? My father. Okay. My father was a movie director. He okay. directed 50 movies. Wow. Including movies in America. And he was Britain's most successful director, uh, virtually, of, of uh, comedies, mm -hmm. doctor films with Dirk Bogart. And, um, and so I grew up in the movies. And my uncle, Gerald Thomas, made him carry on movies. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I had nothing but movies as a child. My house was full of actors like Richard Bardot, mm -hmm. and Gentleman Justice, and Peter Finch, and Catherine Hepburn stayed at my house wow. and Bob Hope you know, my dad was working with them as a director and um, we lived in a house in the country and I grew up in the movies so there's just like a melange of films it's not like sure. a re eureka moment for right, me. right because I was um, it was a slow burn from being born in a, 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 with spinning distance from eating studios where my father was working mm. then living near Pinewood Studios until I grew up and then I moved to London and I started in the movie business as an um, I started at Denim Studios as a um, working in a dark room, and then I got my union card, and I sort of worked. My first film I worked on was called Tamlin, directed by Roddy McDowell, and that was the beginning of my movie career. Was it sort of always accepted in your mind or in your family's mind that uh, minds that that you were going to be in working in the movies, or was there ever consideration given to other there things? There was no consideration for me because yeah. I already had a camera in my hand, and I was making movies in Dirk Bogart's house. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to make films. It's very unusual for somebody um, to have that. Mm -hmm. But I was, um, I think that if you're privileged and lucky enough to be born into something like the movie business, where it was so much part of my family's um, feed, it was so much involved. And my children are all in the movie business as well. And um, it's not a business you can give to the son or daughter like is the family business. Right. But certainly, um, if you have a feeling for it, you know, the by osmosis, you certainly can pick up. And I was just like eager to leave school and go to university. I left school straight away and went to work in the film business. Mm -hmm. I, had no, I had no doubt in my mind what I wanted to do. Within the film business, was there, however, was there uh, a debate about which, which aspect of it to get into? Yeah, well, I, I wanted to be a train driver like my dad, you know. So, story I wanted to do what my dad did. Mm -hmm. so my dad on the film said King of, King of the Said <laughs> I wanted to do that Great. and um, how do you enter the film business well you've got to get a union card in England was very unionised in the film business so to get the, to get a, uh, to get a, a union card to get a union card you have to do many menial jobs as a boy so they got a union card and then I started on the sort of um, film by film I went on unbelievable amount of films as an assistant editor from Harder They Come to Sinbad's Golden Voyage with Ray Harryhausen, mm -hmm. to um, you know, film after film, and with ending up with Ken Loach, mm -hmm. who I eventually graduated to being his editor. Wow. Um, so that was my, my sort of formative years. Mm -hmm. But because uh, I started when I was 17, by the time I was in my 20s, uh, early 20s, I already was chatting in the bit to direct a film, <laughs> which I never got to direct. Because never. I went, well, I have directed. Right, but, but, uh, but uh, at that early stage, that moment, I right, wasn't, I wasn't even mature enough to do it. Mm -hmm. and I didn't, um, and of course, you know, to there's a great deal of difference between um, directors and being a great director, not being a great director, because putting the camera and actors and directing film, it's a very different, you know, it's such a, a difficult job, you know, right. it's a really major job being a film director, and I wasn't uh, equipped. But I was equipped as an editor right. to go to Australia with a friend of mine, Philippe Mora, who just went and just edited a documentary of his called Brother King is Fair and I, which was about America and the Depression. Mm -hmm. And I lived in America for, in New York for an 18-month period. And um, he said, let's go to Australia, where I've got the subject that you can produce and edit the film, and I'll direct the film, I'll direct it. So we went to Australia, and I lived in Australia for a few years, huh. produced my first film. And I was in my mid twenties, and so that was I was off, you know. And then the after that, it's been, on, it's been like a river of life, <laughs> and um, just film after film. Since then, and yeah. Since then, you know. Uh, looking back, aside from I would imagine your immediate family, were there people that were 
particular mentors to you that's, that really were instrumental in your own yeah, success? I've been mean, very fortunate. I had mentors on the business side. Um, and I'd have to put um, Anna Junior, Jay Cantor, and Sandy Leverson, uh, who were major figures in London. Mm-hmm. Um, Jay and Maddie, you know who they are. Mm-hmm. You know, I saw them and the way they behaved with people and I, they were very, very nice with me and encouraging to me. And then Sandy Leverson, I worked with Sandy, he gave me a job as an editor and he was an American in London and he exposed me to many, many things. So he was a, a, a mentor also. And I had him um, on my, um, and then the, then I met some business producers in Hollywood who were very generous with me, Mike Michael Bruskoff, who other producers might met a boy. They were like collegial with me. Mm-hmm. So they were very collegial with me because I was making a certain type of film and I, I found a lot of friendship and, and not mentoring but sort of more than collegiality, sort of a friendship and a sort of brothers in arms. Yeah. And then on the creative side, of course, I had Ken Lynch, like, well, my father. Mm-hmm. You know, I grew up with my father who really directed some pretty good movies. And in fact, there was a very good thing in the New York Times about it the other day. Really? About how he was one of the forgotten filmmakers. Yeah. Then Ken Loach, of course, um, was an extraordinary person to work with because um, he's very, very uh, politically motivated you know, and uh, all his every frame, every word, every every sentiment in the film is politically motivated for something he believes in, which is normally some sort of injustice mm-hmm. um, or some um, idea very strongly against um, society wrong. So that was very strong. Then I worked with Nicholas Rogue. So um, um, I worked with Scott Hosky. Then I had to three films with Nick Rogue, who was an incredible teacher to me. And he taught me so much about filmmaking, about people, about the way. And he really was very influential because I was still in my 20s, I think, when I started working with him at that time. And that was a um, he gets very, very involved with his films. He was, you know, he really lives the film, and I saw a filmmaker living the film, you know, really uh, being with the emotion of the film in another way. You know, wearing the film as a skin, you know, it was mm-hmm. an incredible experience. And I saw that how directed the work, and I saw the work that he did, which was un- unstinting work that he put into a film, and the way he worked, he worked was looked very, yeah, powerful. Mm-hmm. And, Films and I was with him at the moment when he made three very good films. And um, there weren't, it was a time when there was only a producer and director. There was not um, executive producers and associate producers and co producers. It was a, a, an era in the business with a producer and director. And people knew what they did and yeah. it's sort of become cloudy today right. what producing films is about, you know, because there's so many producers sometimes right. just 20 credits on the film you have no idea did what. You know. So that's a sort of shame that you, know, you always know what the director did and you always know what the actor did. Right. It's quite hard to uh, delineate. But well, then, 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 sure, then, sure. Then, of course, the third inspiration was about Richie. You know, ah, uh, of course. Uh, you know, and I don't want to denigrate the Oshima, who I work with, the great Japanese master. Mm-hmm. I do a couple of movies with. It was uh, some, some sort of Asian sensibility. It was very strong. Yeah. And um, but Bertolucci, who I did six movies with, I've done six movies with. That was a very powerful mm-hmm. film to work with. And um, of course, another poetic mm-hmm. and highly intelligent person. No, I got to work with David Cronenberg, <laughs> thankfully, and I've been yeah. very lucky to work with them, um, and you know, don't name a few of them, Benders and etc. Sure. And I work with these sort of master filmmakers yeah. who are fascinating people because when we, like, if you look at the painters, I often equate painters to directors mm-hmm. because when I'm thinking about projects, mm-hmm. I'm thinking about their work and about the big, their sort of text, okay. and then the, then the translation of the text into cinema, and um, it's really thinking about the you know, understanding what the film director does to this text, what he can do, and so I'm thinking about that as a producer, about you know the whole finished. I'm, I'm trying to think about what the finished film is going to be like when I'm working with a filmmaker. You know, so that's something the producer needs to do, and I've been helped 
entirely working with a lot of these directors has mm -hmm. shown me um, a lot about filmmaking, which has been yeah, a wonderful education. I'm still learning. In ter you know, you, you mentioned that people are very vague, are very unclear today about what producers do do. Uh, you know, I think a lot of those producer titles that you mentioned, executive producer, co -producer, those can be in many cases sort of more ceremonial or, or not as not as integral to the process as the producer. I want to ask you though, as somebody who's the real deal, what is what is the responsibility of a producer? What what for the per average guy on the street, what is can you explain what the job actually entails? Well, it's to produce the movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's to get the movie um, made. And uh, sometimes you are, you are responsible for the film. You are the person responsible for taking this film from its infancy um, through to um, the cinemas and even the continuation of the film, looking at history, how do you keep your films alive mm -hmm. and keep them working because so many films sort of self-destruct and yeah. see them. So the job is an endless task when you're with the children. Um, but I suppose the producer is, he, he associates himself with some story, and then he enables it to be made mm -hmm. with a director, um, and with a, an artistic collaborator. So in the case of The Dangerous Method, you had already known and worked numerous times before with David Cronenberg. Uh, what, what was the process you came in, you, did you, did you, were you the, the middleman with the material? No, 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 I, wasn't, I wasn't the motivator. Mm -hmm. I was the um, enabler. Okay. I was the friend of David Cronenberg. I spoke to him. I don't ask him. I speak to him every few months. Mm -hmm. He's a pal. You know. And, um, hey, I mean, do you know about this? I'd like to make this film about you. Right. I put this up on the street. Thanks a lot. I'll let you look at it. And mm -hmm. I did it. And then I um, thought, well, wow. Of, uh, I opted on the rights, got hold of the rights from the studio, which was quite difficult because it had been in, in, in existence in a previous life many years but previously. And then the sort of long journey of trying to make a film convince people mm -hmm. that we could make a movie about the subject. And was financing difficult? Always difficult. Always, yeah. And in this case, even with such big names attached to yeah, it? Well, um, it was feasible because we had a co production. fitted the film into the co-production treaties mm -hmm. which exist in um, countries to help cinema to be made because there's a lot of, sort of financial spin-off on films uh, in Germany they sort of support a certain type of movie to be made and if you want to shoot and spend money there and Canada also supports the national cinema so that was a portion of the budget, not, not the majority of it not a small portion but then I put it together in a way that a producer like me many people like me do it sell pieces of it, sell a bit Borrow a bit, so, right. put a bit in, somehow to get around, you know, right. get make the circle of money, and um, and, um, and and then we did it. You know, many colleagues, we put, you know, we did it together and made this. It was a, I think it was a couple of books, one aborted run, didn't quite do it, and then we um, we managed to sort of pull it all together because it was film was, you know, not it, the Hollywood standard is a very modest film, but by independent standards, it's sort of a lavish film with this sort of sets in it and period film with beautiful costumes and everything's accurate and there's a lot of accuracy in the film and the research of what Freud's Jung's lives were like and then and Sabina and, the, and their, their their own things and their props and everything we had to get those done so that's expensive to do that properly carriages and um, create recreate sort of ship on the ocean period so all that is um, adds up May I ask, I, I believe I've read it somewhere, but I want to confirm with you because you're the ultimate source on this. What was the what was the end cost of making this? It was about $19 million. Wow. And for you, is that typically within, is that within the range of most of the films that you make, or you have sometimes go way lower, way 500, higher? 500000 Really? To $50 million. Wow. Okay. Little Buddha to The Last Emperor of Shorty Sky to The Cup. Right. Or Drum Illusions. Those, you know, those films are made. I'm, I'm not sort of budget range, you know. It's, not, it's really the idea and the story who's making it, and that's it. It's not really, you know, can I get? Can you think I can achieve it? Right. I mean, I, you know, that all's in the hard drive, and and you know, that, that sort of makes a 
decision based on sort of historical knowledge mm -hmm. of how to can I do it? Mm -hmm. can, I, can I achieve this film? But certainly in the film David Cronenberg with actors like this, with the screenplay by Christopher Hampton, that is a um, you know, it's a, of course it's a difficult, but it's a, something that you should be able to do it if yeah. you've got the skill. Um, just for the record, how did you first meet Cronenberg, and what was the and what are if you can list the the projects that up to this point for people that no no I've only done a few of them but I met him in 1980 yeah I remember the spot I met him in a bar in Toronto where the film I produced called Bad Timing with Dick mm -hmm. Rose had won the Labatt mm -hmm. most popular film mm -hmm. and I was in a bar and I was talking with David and he we were talking about films and future projects and you know monthly movies and uh, what do you want to, and he said um, you know something I'd really like to make Naked Lunch and uh, it was like for me a moment of truth you know <laughs> like a flash <laughs> of you're the only guy I mean it's an unfilmable book but if anybody can make that movie you can yeah. make that movie because it can see you can make that movie I said okay let's do it so I went to William Burroughs and I got the rights to the Naked Lunch and we made that movie mm -hmm. and then the second movie I did with was Scratch which was um, J.K. Ballard Again, after the Naked Lunch, in order to do something else together, and I yeah, really like to crash. Again, a book that I was in my, you know, in my mind, a book I'd read, and a book I'd read, was an incredible book, mm -hmm. you know, like a semi unfilmable book, <laughs> uh, Crash. But um, again, you know, David is somebody who can sort of take the essence of a book and to make it as a movie and to keep it absolutely accurate to the essence of the book and the work. And so those are the two other films I've done. These are the three films I've yeah. done with him. And you know, it would be you know, be you know, I really enjoy working with him. You know, because it's um, it's um, and, you know, probably other people you're supposed to do. It's a, it's an enjoyable experience working with him. So mm -hmm. it's like it's not a it's not a challenge for a producer. Yes, it's a challenge. Any film's a challenge, but he's um, very um, prepared and he's a real master filmmaker. So you know, and a confident filmmaker. So he's a you know, very Last question is that we are now we're now entering what has come to be termed the Oscar season when you know the quality movies finally do hit theaters and um, you know we see what happens as far as the the Oscar race. Having I, I want to ask you about the, what must be one of the the crowning achievements of, of your career, looking back at what happened with Last Emperor and all of that that whole experience, and also how much things have changed in the years since then, which I guess it's now twenty four years, um, in the way that you promote a film that is of that caliber, that kind of a movie, a quality, uh, prestige type movie, as you try to get it before audiences and voters and all of that, you know, it, was there was there an uh, awards season in the way that there is today, back then? No, I mean, there was a build-up, yeah. some sort of build-up, but it was actually not like today. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we were completely innocent, but there was no, uh, well, there was no, uh, you know, there was no Oscar race, it was mm -hmm. just like a normal thing. Mm -hmm. and we were completely unaware that we were contenders up until when the film opened. Mm 